shackled by a heavy burden. Beneath the load of guilt and shame, then the hand of Jesus touched me. And now I am no longer the same. How many could say that this this morning? He touched me. Oh, he touched me. And all the joy that floods my soul. Something. verse again. Since I met that blessed Savior, since he cleansed and made me whole, since since I will never cease to praise him. I will never cease to praise him. Even in the bad times, I'm going to praise him. The Sunday school teacher taught this morning we don't need to worry about tomorrow. We don't even need to worry about today. But cast your burden upon the Lord and he will sustain you. Hallelujah. There's something about the word of God even in our worst time. We'll have to say God is good. Are you ready to sing? <laughs> I certainly am. <laughs> Joy, let's start it again. <laughs> Since I met this blessed Savior And since he cleansed and made me whole Are you whole this morning? I will never cease to praise him I'll shout it while eternity rolls. He touched me. Oh, he touched me. He touched me. And oh, the joy that floods my soul. Something happened, and now I know he touched me and made me whole. I have something to say, but I don't want to cry, and I'm going to cry, and I might as well pre-warn you. 
bless her Lord. Ooh, bless her Lord. Yes, thank you, Jesus. I don't praise him because everything goes my way. Yes. I don't praise him because he always answers me the way I want my prayers answered. And I look out and I see every one of you has had prayers you feel like did not get answered the right way. Every one of you. I don't know anybody here. We always feel like we're the only one, but I look at you and I don't know anybody here who hasn't struggled in some area, but we praise him because he's God, because he's worthy. And even if there's not physical problems, there's heart problems and there's spirit problems. There's emotional problems problems and I don't care how much we look like everything's perfect don't you believe it for a minute we're all in a broken world and we are all humans and we all mess up and we all struggle with something but he can touch you and change everything yes. he can touch you and heal the deepest emotional pain, the deepest physical pain, he can touch you and that is why we praise him because yes. he created us and he's our father. Yes, he is. And if any of you are fathers, you know how much you love your children. You cannot love them enough. You know how a father feels and that's our father. And he does things sometimes because he knows it's best, because he knows the end from the beginning. And I can just be sure that I'll say, no, it should have been this way. And he says, no, I love you. I'm your father. It wouldn't have been my plan. And like I say, it's not always my favorite thing. Mm -mm. But I want everybody here to just remember when he touched you that first time. Yes. when he touched you and changed your heart and when you repented and you asked him to come in and take over. Man, sometimes it's been a long time, <laughs> but please remember what it was like before and what it was like after he lifted that burden of sin. And he is going to be with us through whatever we go. And I always think, what I have a choice, I can go through hard times with him or I can go through hard times without him. We're going to go through hard times. But I'd rather go through them with him, with a loving father who has my best at heart, no matter how much it deprives me or no matter how much it hurts me. I know my father and I know he's good and I know he has a plan and I wish I could see the end from the beginning, but I can't. So we praise him because of who he is and because he's worthy. Let's pray. Father, we praise you for who you are. And Lord, we can't see you with our physical eyes. We can't touch you with our hands. But Lord, just because we can't see you and because we can't reach out and touch you with our, with our physical body doesn't mean that you're not there. There are many things that we know exist that we can't see or we can't touch, but they're still very real. And you are the most real thing in this universe because you spoke and it came to be. You are the force behind everything that lives, everything that moves, and everything that is. You're so great that you could just speak the word and galaxies would come into being. You're so great that you could just speak the word and life would come forth from a molecular level to the most complex being that exists. 
You're so great that just by your word, the orbits of the planets and stars continue. And because you're so great, we praise you. Because you are the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end, the first and the last. And because you, in all your greatness, loved us enough to bring us into existence. And then when we became rebellious, you loved us enough to pay the ultimate price that we might be redeemed. We love you and praise you because you loved us enough to forgive every sin. And not just to forgive, but to forget. We praise you because you loved us enough to prepare a place for us. And to ensure and certify that you will return for your people. We don't understand all that we go through. We don't see the end from the beginning. But Lord, we're looking to you. And we thank you that you've made yourself available to us. You've revealed yourself by your word, both written and living. And Jesus came to reveal who the Father is. So today we praise you. And we thank you and we worship you in this house. And we thank you that as great as you are, and as awesome and immense that you have said that where two or three are gathered in my name, there am I in the midst of them. Thank you for your presence in the house today. So, Lord, we give this time to you, and we ask you to be glorified <coughs> and help us to praise you and to worship you and to trust you and you alone as we walk through this world, knowing that you walk with us. In Jesus' name, and everybody said... Amen. Amen. Well, good morning. It's good to be here with you. I'm sorry I didn't get to be with you Sunday, last Sunday. I'm sorry I didn't get to be with you for the hallelujah. But you wouldn't have wanted me to be with you because I might have shared something with you that you wouldn't have appreciated very much. <clears throat> but praise the Lord. Thank you for your prayers. I am feeling much better. Um. I'm not yet back to where I can probably jump a pew, but we're getting there. Anyway, I do appreciate all the prayers for my wife. She has had a lot of suffering over the last couple of weeks, but I am believing in the touch of God. Uh, a few quick announcements. Uh, there will be prayer meeting beginning back tonight at 6 o'clock, and we need prayer. Uh, also, uh, was asked to announce that uh, the packing of shoe boxes will be on Saturday the 12th at 5 p.m. and dinner will be served. So that's happening. I believe that this week is nursing home at Yancey House, 6 o'clock. And Wednesday evening we'll be back at Bible study at 7 o'clock. So those are the announcements that I have. Anybody else have another one? Uh, if you want to sing or read or do something in the hanging of the green, it is not far away. It is the last Sunday of this month. So um, more than happy to have you share something, uh, uh, bring a sacrifice to the Lord, a sacrifice of praise or something you've written or something you've read or something you want to sing. I don't care if you've never sung in church in your life. I don't care. This is the time to do it. Okay? See me or Teresa or Kim, just anybody. We'll get the news around it and we'll see that you have what you need to do it. Robert says you can bring something you cooked if you want to do that. If it's your gift. Amen. <laughs> All right. <laughs> Any more announcements? Yes, ma'am. That is a praise report. All right. <clears throat>
Anything else? Amen. I do appreciate all the hard work for Hallelujah. And I hate that I missed it, but I heard some good reports. So thanks, everybody. Okay, any more? Mm. Okay. All right. Well, Father, we just lift Billy to you right now. And, Lord, there's nothing beyond your ability. So, Lord, we ask you to have mercy and touch him. And, Lord, just bring healing. Father, we put him in your hands this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, anybody else? Remind me what her first name is. Jennifer. Well, Father, we just live Jennifer to you right now. You know what she needs. And, Lord, you're the God that supplies all our need according to your riches and glory. So, Father, we ask you to move in Jennifer's life. And we put her in your hands in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. Any others? All right. Well, let's stand up and worship the Lord. He is worthy. say that this morning yes. when I'm broken Lord you are my strength you're my strength you're my love you're my life you're my joy my song in the night how I marvel at your mercy and I sing, let's praise Him this morning. And I sing praise, praise to the Lord, oh, praise, praise to the Lord, for He good and merciful his love is great he's so wonderful my lord and in the battles lord you are my peace thank you jesus yeah yeah and when i'm broken lord you are my strength, you're my strength, you're my love, you're my life, you're my joy, my song in the night. How I marvel at your mercy, and I sing. And I sing praise, praise to the Lord, Ooh, yeah. praise, 
praise to the Lord. For he is good and merciful. His love is great. He's so wonderful, my Lord. Oh, sing praise. So I, I sing, sing praise. Praise to the Lord. Praise. Praise to the Lord. For he is good and merciful. His love is great. He's so wonderful, my Lord. Yes, he's good. Yes, he is. For oh, he is good and merciful. His love is great. He's so wonderful, my Lord. Yes, Lord, you're good. For he is good and merciful. His love is great. He's so wonderful, my Lord, we declare that you're good this morning, even though, even though things don't always go the way we want them to. Even though every answer to prayer is not necessarily the one we ask for. Lord, even though there's hurt and disappointment, Lord, we still declare that you're good. Because the word tells us that you are. And Lord, this morning we worship. We praise you not because of how we feel and not because of what we see happening in the world around us, but Lord, we praise you because you're almighty God. We praise you because you know the end from the beginning. And Lord, today I pray that you help every one of us to praise and worship you. Lord, however, however we're moved to do that, Lord, whether it's just by lifting up our hands or lifting up our voices, Lord, or, or even if it's, Lord, dancing in your presence, or just bowing on our knees before you. God, help us to worship you this morning. Some like to lift up holy hands. Some like to dance like David danced. Some cry and others just smile. Some like to stand up and others bow. It's the heart that God sees. Offered in sincerity. sincerity. In spirit and truth we are called. There's liberty in Him for all When we worship Him With our heart and soul We can enter in Where the river flows It's a higher place Of where the Spirit blows When we worship Him Each one has their secret place, yeah, and their own garment of praise. And the joy that we're all searching for, it's found in the presence of the Lord. When we worship Him with our heart and soul, we can enter in where the river flows. It's a higher place of where the Spirit blows when we worship Him. Oh, worship Him. Yes. 
We love you, Lord. Mm, you're worthy, you're worthy, mm. worthy. In spirit and truth we are called. And there's liberty in him for all. When we worship him with our heart and soul, we can enter in. Where the river flows, it's a higher place of where the Spirit blows when we worship Him. Oh, it's a higher place of where the Spirit blows and we worship Him. Spirit and in truth. In spirit and truth we are called. There is liberty in Him for all. When we worship Him with our heart and soul, we can enter in where the river flows. And it's a higher place. Of where the Spirit blows when we worship Him. It's a higher place of where the Spirit blows and we worship Him. Lord, we worship you this morning. Mm, hallelujah, hallelujah. Bless your name, Jesus. Bless your name, Jesus. Blessed be the name of the Lord. God, I pray that every breath that we breathe would be praise to you. We pray that, Lord, today. Let us be a people of praise, not contingent upon our situation or how we feel. But God, just let it be, let it be every Every breath that comes from my body would be praise to you. Hallelujah. Glory, 
Glory, hallelujah, glory. Glory, hallelujah, every breath is praise. Come on back from the wilderness, the wilderness and roaming. Come on back from the wilderness and weary from your tears. Come on back from the wilderness, the wilderness and roaming. Come on back from the wilderness and lean upon his chair. Come on back from the glory, wilderness, glory, hallelujah, glory, glory, hallelujah, glory, hallelujah, every breath is free. Glory, glory, hallelujah, glory, glory, hallelujah, glory, glory, hallelujah, every breath is free. Oh, the ladder will be greater. So, child of God, keep moving on. Don't you know? He's coming back for all his glory. We're going to sing the victory song. Yeah, 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 yeah. Glory, glory, hallelujah, glory. Glory, hallelujah, glory. Glory, hallelujah, every breath is praise. Glory. Glory, hallelujah, glory. Glory, hallelujah, glory. Glory, hallelujah, every breath is praise. Come on back from the glory, wilderness, the wilderness glory, and glory. Glory, hallelujah, glory. Back from the glory, hallelujah, every breath is praise. Come on back from the glory, hallelujah, glory. Glory, hallelujah, glory. Glory, hallelujah, every breath is praise. Amen. Yes, yes. I think everybody in here is walking through the fire. I love that verse. If you're walking through the fire and the devil thinks he's one liar, he's a liar and he's the father of lies. And when he tells you he's winning, you tell him he's a liar. And... You just lift your voice and you remind him that you are a blood-bought child of God. Do it. I'm telling you, these days we have to do that. We have to take those thoughts captive and we have to say, no, I am a child of God. I am covered in his blood. I am redeemed. You have no authority in my life. You must flee I submit to God. I resist you in the name of Jesus, and Amen. you have to flee. Guys, we have to do it. We have to do it because is there anybody in here he has not been tormenting? Well, I'm, I want to know how you do that. But I, I, I don't know. I don't think he'll ever stop tormenting us, but we have authority over him through the spirit of Jesus Christ that lives in us, the spirit that raised Christ from the dead lives in us and we have authority and we need to take it. Amen. <clears throat> you are the word at the beginning one with God the Lord most high your hidden glory in creation now revealed in you are Christ what a beautiful name it is what a beautiful name it is the name of Jesus Christ, my King. What a beautiful name it is. Nothing compares to this. What a beautiful name it is. The name of Jesus. Didn't want heaven without us. Jesus, you brought heaven down. My 
sin was great, your love was greater. What could separate us now? What a wonderful name it is. What a wonderful name it is. The name of Jesus Christ, my King. What a wonderful name it is. Nothing compares to this. What a wonderful name it is. The name of Jesus. What a wonderful name it is. The name of Jesus. Death could not hold you, the veil tore before you, silence the bones of sin and grave. The heavens are roaring, the praise of your glory, for you are raised to life again. You have no rival, you have no equal. Now and forever, God, you reign. Yours is the kingdom, and yours is the glory. Yours is the name above all names. What a powerful name it is. What a powerful name it is. The name of Jesus Christ, my King. What a powerful name it is, nothing can stand against. What a powerful name it is, the name of Jesus. Death could not hold you, the veil tore before you. You silenced the boast of sin and grave. The heavens are roaring, the praise of your glory. For you are raised to life again. You have no rival, and you have no equal. Now and forever, God, you reign. Yours is the kingdom, and yours is the glory. Yours is the name above all names. What a powerful name it is, what a powerful name it is, the name of Jesus Christ, my King. What a powerful name it is, nothing can stand against, what a powerful name it is, the name of Jesus. What a powerful name it is, the name of Jesus. What a powerful name it is, the name of Jesus. Yes, Lord, we give you glory in the house today. You are worthy. You're worthy. You're worthy. You're worthy. We bless your name. Thank you for that powerful name of Jesus. Lord, there's no name like that name. It's above every name. And Lord, at that name, every knee must bow. And every tongue confess. And the word says that's true in heaven and in earth and under the earth. God, we're so thankful for the name of Jesus. And you've given us that name, Lord, to grant us access to the very throne room of God. You've given us that name to cause the devils to tremble. You've given us that name that is a name of authority over all principalities and powers of this world. God, we're so thankful for the name of Jesus. And we praise and we glorify that name today. God, we give you all this that today is yours, Lord. We pray that you would be blessed. And Father, we thank you for the privilege of worship in Jesus' name. Amen. You can be seated.
Y'all did bring lunch, didn't you? You got what? Gummies? That's all right. I'll pass. <clears throat> now, you know how it is. If a preacher doesn't get to preach in three or four services, there's no telling what will happen next. In fact, I have got about three messages that I'd like to share with you, but uh, since you didn't bring lunch, I'll try to give you the thumbnail sketch of all three, and we may elaborate later. <clears throat> it's not hot enough. <laughs> We'd be out in time for the evening service, right? Oh, my goodness. It is a lot of fun down there when they say, don't quit. You mean you just, you, you're not, you're through already? Lord have mercy. And here we're looking at our watch and saying, can we beat somebody to the steakhouse? <laughs> and let me tell you, you can't do it. There's always somebody quicker. Well, folks, I'm going to minister to you this morning on an interesting topic. It says, where are you looking and what are you wearing? And somebody said, you're getting personal. <laughs> Where are you looking and what are you wearing? <clears throat> Father, as we turn to the word, give us ears to hear what you would say. Lord, let Holy Spirit speak and let me shut up. And God, I pray that what the people hear would be only what you would have them to hear this day. I love you and I surrender to you in Jesus' name. Amen. I'm going to begin in Psalm 32 and verse 8 and it says this, I will instruct thee and I will teach thee in the way which thou shalt go. And I will guide thee with my eye. How many of you feel like we need guidance today? How many of you feel like we need to know what the truth is? <laughs> Boy, we hear enough of the other, other stuff. <clears throat> but we need to know the truth. So we need the Lord instructing us and we need him guiding us. And he said that he would guide us with his eye. Now here's the thing. If he's going to guide us with his eye, we're going to have to be looking the same way he's looking. So the problem is, and I know it's true in my life, and I think it's true in most of the lives of the people that I know that are Christians, is usually we're not necessarily looking in the same direction God is. As a rule, there are three directions that people look, and even children of God look in three directions. Sometimes we're looking at the past. Sometimes we're focused on the, future, uh, the present. And sometimes we're looking at the future. And there's a lot of Christians that dwell on the past. Oh, man, if we, things could be just like they used to be. What, how awesome the past was. If we could just go back. Well, <laughs> you know, I've noticed in my life that I tend to remember things better than they were. You know, we, we, we remember good things, and sometimes we forget about the bad stuff. But I don't know what it is. We've got to filter somewhere that only lets us remember the wonderful things or we thought that were so wonderful in the past. And so many Christians are focused on the past. Man, that was, a, that was a great service. Or, boy, things used to be so wonderful. Or if we could do things like we used to do it. Well, there's a real problem about being focused in that direction. One of the greatest examples I know of, it happened back in Genesis chapter 19 when God decided that he was going to destroy Sodom and Gomorrah. And uh, he came down and he told Abraham what he was about to do. And he did that because he and Abraham were tight. And folks, I'm telling you, we need to be tight with God. And the other reason he did it, of course, was he knew that Abraham had family down there in Sodom. Lot and his family were there. So God came and he met with Abraham. And you know the story of how God said, I, I got to tell you what I'm going to do. He said, the sin, the cry of Sodom has come up before me, and I've got to see if it's as, it, as I've, I've heard it told. And if it is, I'm going to destroy them. And you remember how Abraham started talking to God about, well, will you destroy the righteous with the wicked? And Abraham begins to be an intercessor and a negotiator, and he gets down, well, if you find so many righteous, you know, 40, 20, 40 30, 20, what about 10? God said, if I can find 10 righteous, I won't destroy them. Man, couldn't find ten righteous in all the city. Mercy. But if you remember what happened in his mercy, God sent two angels down there to Lot's house. And they told Lot what they were about to do. And they said, you got to come out because we're going we're gonna to level this place. 
And I want to read you a couple of things here from Genesis chapter 19, verse 15. It says, And when the morning arose, then the angels hastened Lot, saying, Arise, take thy wife and thy two daughters which are here, lest thou be consumed in the iniquity of the city. And while he lingered, the men laid hold on his hand and upon the hand of his wife and upon the hand of his two daughters. And the Lord being merciful unto him, they brought him forth and set him without the city. And it came to pass when they were brought abroad that he said, Escape for thy life, and look not behind thee, neither stay in all the plain. Escape to the mountain, lest thou be consumed. Jump down to verse 26. But the, his wife looked back from behind him, and she became a pillar of salt. Let me tell you something. When our focus is on the past, when we're living in the past, when we cling to the past, and that's what she was doing, and even Lot was trying to linger because he, he, he didn't want to leave what he'd become comfortable with. When we're in that kind of situation, we're immobilized. When we're clinging to the past and when our focus is on the past, we're immobilized. We can't escape. We can't move forward. We can't help anybody. The past holds us captive. We can't keep our focus on the past because God is a God who moves. He keeps going. He keeps moving on. Let me read this to you from Isaiah chapter 43, 18 and 19. God speaking through the prophet Isaiah said, Remember ye not the former things. Neither consider the things of old. Behold, I will do a new thing. Now it shall spring forth. Shall you not know it? I will even make a way in the wilderness and rivers in the desert. You see, if we dwell in the past, if our focus is on the past, we're going to miss what God's doing now. And God's doing a new thing. And we don't want to miss it. He's making a way. He's getting ready to pour out water in the wilderness. We can't be focusing on the past and looking in that direction when God is looking ahead. If he's going to guide us with his eye, we have to look the way he's looking. A lot of believers are focused on the here and now, the present, the cares of this world, trials, tribulations, and so on and so forth. Well, what's, what's wrong with being focused on the here and now and on the present? <clears throat> well, the Bible gives us a pretty good example of, of the problem with that. And I'm going to read this to you from the book of Luke, chapter 12, and beginning in verse 16, and most of us are familiar with this story of the prosperous farmer <clears throat> that had just had a bumper crop of everything, and uh, he was really happy. So uh, Luke chapter 12, beginning in verse 16, Jesus is speaking. He said, the ground of a certain rich man brought forth plentifully. And he thought within himself, saying, what shall I do? Because I have no room where to bestow my fruits. And he said, this will I do. I'll pull down my barns, I'll build greater, and there will I bestow all my fruits and my goods, and I'll say to my soul, Soul, thou hast much goods laid up for many years. Take thy ease, eat, drink, and be merry. But God said to him, Thou fool, this night thy soul shall be required of thee. Then who shall those things be which thou hast provided? So is he that lays up treasure for himself and is not rich toward God. You see, if our focus is completely on the present, on our possessions, on what we can accumulate, on our prosperity, on our wealth, or if it's focused on the problems that we're seeing in the world around us, the Bible tells us that our life is, is strangled. It can't bear fruit. If we're focused on this present time, regardless of whether it's on the trouble of the time or if it's on the things that we have or things we can accumulate or what we think we're going to need, then there's a problem. In fact, if you turn back to Mark chapter 4, Jesus is speaking again, and in verse 19 of Mark chapter 4, he says this, The cares of this world, the deceitfulness of riches, the lust of other things entering in choke the word, and it becomes unfruitful. When Matthew gave that account, he said, he becomes unfruitful. You see, if our, if our concentration, if what we're continually thinking about is right now, uh, you know, making sure we've got everything we need, making sure we've got something laid up for the future, or, you know, what's going to happen, focusing on the trouble that's all around us, and on and on and on, it chokes us. It chokes the Word of God in us to where it can't be fruitful. It chokes the, the Holy Spirit in us till he can't be fruitful and it chokes us so that we can't be fruitful as well. And it's dangerous not to be fruitful. 
because John 15 and 2, Jesus said this, every branch in me that bears not fruit, he takes away. And I'm not going to elaborate on that. I'm just going to leave it at that. You see, God, God is always moving. God's not stagnant. God doesn't stay in one spot. And when we're focused completely on the present, he can't guide us, we're unfruitful, and we're in a dangerous position. And then there's the future. And there are some Christians that are focused on the future. And I'm not talking about the uncertainty. I'm not talking about the fearful things that, that we see happening and I'm not, uh, the maybes or what ifs. And I'm not talking about focusing on the fear of not knowing. I'm talking about focusing on the certainty and the comfort of what we do know what we do know. Colossians 3, 2 says, set your affection on things above and not on the things on the earth. In, in Luke 12 and 34, Jesus said, where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. You see, God's always moving and he's always moving toward eternity. And the only way that he can guide us is if our focus is on eternity like, like his. Paul was writing over in the book of Philippians chapter 3, verses 13 and 14. He said, Brethren, I count not myself to have apprehended or to have arrived or grabbed everything I need, but this one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forth unto those things which are before, I press toward the mark for the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. Paul said, I'm not going to cling to the past. I'm not going to even cling to things that were good in the past. I'm not going to dwell on the things that were bad in the past. I'm not going to dwell on the imprisonment that I might be in right now. I've got my mind on the future because God has told me what's in store. God showed me things that he's got laid up for me. And you remember what, what, what Paul wrote when he was writing to the Roman church. He said, you know, we can't even begin to imagine what God has prepared for those that love him. It's just beyond comprehension. So Paul, you know, pressed on because his focus was on eternity. His focus was on the future. It wasn't on whose dungeon he was in at the present time. It was not, not on the fact that he had been locked up in prison. It wasn't on the fact that he had been stoned or the fact that he had been beaten or the fact that he had been shipwrecked. It was on what was in store. One of the greatest examples of living that way we find over in the book of Hebrews chapter 12. And this is talking about Jesus. Listen, it says, Wherefore, seeing we also are compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which does so easily beset us, and let us run with patience the race set before us, looking to Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. Now listen to this. Who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is set down on the right hand of the throne of God. You see, the reason Jesus could face the cross. The reason Jesus could face the, the rejection by his countrymen, the reason that Jesus could, would, could face the turning away from him of disciples and people that had been following him, the reason that he could stand being beaten, spit upon, ridiculed and rejected was for the joy that was ahead. And what was that joy? Well, it was the defeat of Satan for one thing. It was the redemption of mankind. And it was the knowledge that before long, he would get to spend eternity with his bride, which is the church of Jesus Christ. That's what his eye was on. That's what he was focusing on. So that's what our focus has got to be on as well. If we're going to be directed and guided by God's eye, we've got to look where he's looking. He's not looking at the past. He's not overcome by the present. His eye is what's ahead. He's looking at the, at the culmination of all things. And that's why he gave us the word of God. It shows us what's going to happen. It shows us the, the, what's happening in the end. It tells us these things are going to take place. But after this, after this, Jesus is coming to rule and to reign, to set up his kingdom on this earth for a thousand years. Satan will be bound in the bottomless pit. <coughs> things will be exactly as they were in the Garden of Eden or even better. That's what's ahead. And then there's eternal life and eternity in his presence for the children of God. That's what his focus is on. And that's what our focus has to be on as well. So that's the part about where are you looking? <clears throat> are you looking at the past? Are you looking at the present? Or is your eye on the future?
And folks, we've got to be eternal, eternally minded people. Our eyes got to be on the future. So now let's go on to this. What are you wearing? <laughs> How many of you know that God's got a dress code? <laughs> now I'm not talking about where women should wear a skirt or pants. <coughs> I'm not talking about where men ought to wear blue jeans or suits. I'm not talking about where our hair should be short or long or gone. <laughs> I'm talking about what God's dress code is. If you want to know what it is, let's go to Colossians chapter 3. <clears throat> Colossians chapter 3, verse 12. Put on, therefore. In other words, it means to get your clothes on. <clears throat> Put on, therefore, as the elect of God, holy and beloved, bowels of mercy. Boy, that's an expression we don't use today. <clears throat> <coughs> Kindness, humbleness of mind, meekness, long-suffering, forbearing one another and forgiving one another. If any man has a quarrel against any, even as Christ forgave you, so also do you. And above all these things, put on love, which is the bond of perfectness. Now, I want you to hear this in today's English. It says this, since God chose you to be the holy people he loves, you must clothe yourselves with tender-hearted mercy or compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. Make allowance for each other's faults. Forgive anyone who offends you. Remember, the Lord forgave you, so you must forgive others. And above all, clothe yourselves with love, which binds us all together in perfect harmony. So, let's talk a little bit about uh, God's dress code. <clears throat> the first garment he's talking about is mercy or compassion. And uh, some of us, and I know I've, I've done this, some of us feel like the discerning of other people's flaws and faults is a sign of our own spirituality. Folks, I'm telling you, it's not. The real mark of Christ-likeness is to have our hearts moved by what other people are going through. You know, there's an old saying is, don't judge me till you've walked a mile in my shoes. And there's a lot of truth in that. I love that old song that says, he looked beyond my faults and saw my need. And that's what God's calling us to do. He said, put on that garment of compassion. Have compassion on people that are suffering. Have compassion on people that are messing up, that are heading down the wrong road. Because as the saying is, there but by the grace of God go I. Every time I had the privilege of ministering in a prison, that was the thought in my mind. There but by the grace of God. Every time I minister people in the nursing home or wherever in, in, in bad situations. And, and that compassion is something that I pray for when I encounter people that are so lost and so, you know, away from everything that they should be doing that God would want them to be doing. It's so easy to say, look at that crazy person. Look at this person that's doing this, this, and this. When we should have that garment of compassion on that would cause us to look beyond what they're doing to the reason that they're doing it, the ache and the hurting in their heart, the fact that they're so lost. We're quick to give up on people. Aren't you glad that God had compassion on you? The next garment is kindness. <laughs> I can remember as a, as, a, as a child, the adults that were kind to a kid that was always full of questions, and I was. I wanted to know why. <laughs> I wondered, you know, have you, have, have, you, have you had any of your children to do that? You tell them to do something, why? They, my parents used to call me, why? <laughs> and then after I got a little older, I wanted to know how things worked. And it was how, you know. <laughs> I remember the ones that were patient. I remember the ones that were kind and would take time for a kid that was just an aggravation. And I can also remember those that were too busy or too sour or too bitter to be troubled by a pesky child. You might remember the story of Solomon's son, Rehoboam, when Solomon passed away and Rehoboam came to power. When he was beginning his rule, the elders, the people that had seen most of it and all of it, <clears throat> came to him and said, let me tell you something. 
If you will be kind to these people, they'll serve you forever. But instead, he was too full of himself, too arrogant, too proud. It resulted in a civil war. It resulted in him losing the majority of the kingdom. And it resulted in the death of a lot of people. The Bible tells us that love's kind. And if God is love, he's kind. And if God's love's in us, we better be kind. God tells us to clothe ourselves with humility. And you see, humility is the opposite of pride. Arrogant. God resists the proud, but he gives grace to the humble. And here's something. If you ever begin to feel proud, stop, as Joel was talking about a while ago, and remember what you used to be. Remember where you came from. We've not got anything to be proud about except Jesus. We have nothing in which to glory except the cross of Christ. Psalm 25, 9 says, The meek will he guide in judgment. The meek will he teach his way. If you look the word up in the, in the Hebrew, it means humble. The humble will he guide in judgment. The humble will he teach his way. If we want God's guidance, we have to be a humble people. When we think we're better than somebody, when we think we're smarter than somebody, when, we're think, when we think we're more holy than somebody, then folks, that's pride. That's not humility. And if we want that relationship with God, if we're putting on the clothes that he's calling us to put on, one of them, one garment better be humility. Most of us are familiar with this scripture in Philippians chapter 2 beginning in verse 5. It says, let this mind be in you which was in Christ Jesus who being in the form of God thought it not robbery to be equal to God but made himself of no reputation. Can you imagine the king of kings and lord of lords making himself of no reputation and took on him the form of a servant and was made in the likeness of men, and being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient to death, even the death of the cross. And it began with, let this mind be in you. Folks, we better be a humble people. If we want God to guide us, if we want God's blessing upon our life, then he says to be clothed with gentleness. One scholar, as he was translating that particular passage of Scripture, translated gentleness as this, the grace to accept life. <laughs> the grace to accept what comes. The grace not to, not to rage and, <laughs> and rant when life happens. And folks, let me tell you, life happens. In this world, you'll have tribulation. Many of the afflictions of the righteous. It goes on and on. So life's going to happen. And gentleness needs to be there when things don't go the way we hoped and when the bottom drops out of our plans, we need that gentleness in our life. We, if we don't have that gentleness, we dishonor the Lord by venting our irritation as if God was not aware of our situation. I've done it so many times, God forgive me. And then another garment is this, patience or long-suffering, as the King James says. You know, <laughs> when people let us down, boy, we need that, that garment of patience rather than becoming resentful. God would never have told us to be patient with one another and forgive one another if he didn't already know that there's going to be things that were hard to bear. And there are. When we're angry and when we're resentful against someone who has hurt us, God must shake his head. Think about how much patience God had with every one of us while we were off doing the things in rebellion against him. How long he was patient waiting for us to come to him. I'm so glad for God's patience. I'm so glad for his long suffering. God help us to put off our old clothes and put on the new clothes that will allow him to bless us so that we can in turn bless one another. There's one other thing I want you to consider this morning. Why is so much happening to good people? Now, Joel was talking earlier that she didn't think there was a single person in here that hadn't been going through or wasn't going through some kind of trouble. And it's truth. And everywhere you look, God's people are having a hard time. 
And not just because the, the world is against them, but just hard times. Let's look at something that 1 Peter chapter 4 says. 1 Peter chapter 4 and verse 17. For the time is come that judgment must begin at the house of God. And if it first began at us, what shall the end of them be that obey not the gospel of God? Here's what's going on, and I believe this with all my heart. The Bible tells us that Jesus is returning soon and is returning for a bride without spot or wrinkle or blemish. His return is imminent. So the cleansing and preparation of the, of the bride has been accelerated. And I believe this. He's allowing things to come into the lives of his children that will reveal where we're looking and reveal what we're wearing. We've got to realize that God allows things to take place to purify us. Now, when things are going well and when it's smooth sailing, there's not a lot of repentance going on. When everything is the way we want it to be, there's not a lot of crying out to God and trying to get close to God. But folks, when things start going south, that's when we get on our face before God. That's when we begin to cry out to Him. That's when we begin to repent and say, Lord, is there something between us? God is moving to expose what's in our heart. God's allowing things. And folks, let me tell you something. If you want to know what's in somebody, inside of somebody, watch what happens when they're suffering. Watch what happens when things are going wrong and, and, and all kinds of stuff is taking place in their life, things that they don't understand. See what comes out. You know, when a pot's broken, what's inside spills. And God is working in us to make sure that what's in us is what needs to be in us. What we're wearing is what we need to be wearing, and where we're looking is where we need to be looking. Jesus is coming back, and he's coming back for a bride without spot or blemish. Most of us, <clears throat> most of us are familiar with the story of Ananias and Sapphira. In the early days of the church, people were selling things that they had, <clears throat> bringing the money to the apostles so that distribution could be made to the poor and those that were hurting. And this man and his wife had a piece of property, and they were going to sell it and give the money to the, to the church. <coughs> but they made up a plan. They said, what we're going to do is sell it for this much, but we'll report that we sold it for this much, and we'll keep what's over. If you remember what happened, when they did that and when they lied, God revealed it to Peter. And Peter said, why have you conspired together to lie to the Holy Spirit? And man, uh, Ananias dropped dead. And his wife came in a short time later, and Peter asked her, did you sell the property for this much? She said, yes. And he said, you know, you've, you've lied to the Holy Spirit as well. She dropped dead. It's, it's, it's dangerous, folks, not to be honest with God. It's dangerous not to be in right relationship. It's dangerous not to be looking where he's looking and wearing what he's told us to wear. God's cleaning up his church. He's cleaning up his bride because he's getting ready to come back. So we're seeing that happening right now. We're seeing it take place. And God's allowing things in our life to expose what's in us so that it can be brought out and the right stuff put back. <clears throat> God has to cleanse us and purify us before he can bless and before he can pour out his spirit. <clears throat> you see, when trouble comes, and it will, don't answer the door in your old clothes. Put on that new that new outfit that God has provided, patience, gentleness, humility, kindness, compassion, and love, and trust God to accomplish his purpose. Trust him to bring you through, knowing that he's got a plan, and it's for your good and his glory. And he will lead us if we're looking in the direction that he's looking and moving. Let's bow our heads. Father, I pray today for every one of us here. And God, we know that very soon, very soon, you're going to return for your people. And very soon, the Antichrist is going to come to power. And very soon, tribulation is going to break out across this world like this world has never seen. In fact, the Bible tells us that it will be so bad that if you didn't shorten the days, nobody would survive it. Lord, we want to be right with you. We want to be ready at your return. 
We don't want to go through the things that are ahead. We pray to be counted worthy to escape the things that are coming upon this earth. And the only way we can is to have Jesus Christ as our Savior and to be in a right relationship with Him. And right now, right now, this day, I pray for every person in this room. And Lord, if there's anybody here today that knows in their heart they've never asked Jesus to be their Savior. They've never asked Jesus to forgive their sin. They've never asked Jesus to write their name in the book of life. Lord, if there's anyone here today, deal with that heart. Cause them to understand how late the hour is and what's at stake. And Lord, help them to ask you to save them. And as our heads are bowed right now, I want to give you this opportunity. I don't want to ever not give people an opportunity to give their life to Jesus. So right now, as our heads are bowed and as we wait in a moment of prayer, if you're here and you've never asked Jesus to come into your heart, I'm going to ask you to do that right now. And I'm going to ask you to just lift your hand to him and say, Lord, I'm right here. I want you to come into my heart. I give my life to you. Would you do that? Would you ask Jesus to be your Savior? Because if you do, you don't have to worry about this future because God's got it. Lord, I pray that you deal with every one of us today. Father, I want to thank you that you have provided the clothes that we need for the hour in which we live. Help us to all put those clothes on today and help us to be the people that are walking with you in the direction that you're going. And I ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, we're not done. <clears throat> you thought you were going to get out, but you're not. <clears throat> in the book of 1 Corinthians chapter 12, this... Oh, you didn't know there's three sermons? I'm kidding. Just, just, some, just a couple of minutes. You'll be all right. You'll let the crowd die down at the steakhouse. All right. <clears throat> First Corinthians chapter 12 and verse 18. But now has God set members, every one of them, in the body as it has pleased him. Listen to it again. But now has God set the members, every one of them, in the body as it has pleased him. You see, if we're following God's guidance, he places us where he wants us. And he leads us where he wants us to go. Now, over the last few months, we've had some folks that felt like God was leading them somewhere else. And let me tell you something. I will never fault anybody for going where God says go. That's what I want people to do. So I praise the Lord for those folks. And I, I would never say anything to them about it. If you're following what God tells you to do, then you do that. But God places people in the body where he wants them. And today we have the privilege of receiving two fellows into a position in the church. Now, we've, we've had some deacons step down from being deacons because they felt the Lord was telling them to do that. And I have no problem with that whatsoever. Do what God tells you to do. You'll never get in trouble doing what God tells you to do. But we've had a couple of folks step forward to become deacons. And I want to read this to you from uh, Acts chapter 6. This is how deacons came about. It says, And in those days <clears throat> when the number of the disciples was multiplied, there arose a murmuring of the Grecians against the Hebrews because their widows were being neglected in the daily ministration. Now, what that means <coughs> is this. When, when, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> it's not used to this much. <coughs> All right, Dale, we'll get going. When people were being given food and help, by the church, <clears throat> the Hebrews were getting priority. So the Greeks, or the Hellenists, <coughs> felt neglected, and there was a rift coming. <clears throat> so that's why this took place. Then the twelve called the multitude of the disciples. Well, I ain't going to get through this. <coughs> <coughs> Pray harder. <coughs> Amen. <clears throat> then the twelve called the multitude of disciples unto them and said, 
it's not reason that we should leave the word of God and serve tables. <coughs> Wherefore, brethren, look out among you seven men of honest report, full of the Holy Ghost and wisdom, whom we may appoint over this business. But we will give ourselves continually to prayer and ministry of the word. <coughs> now the saying pleased the multitude. <coughs> Excuse me. And they chose seven fellows. Okay. And when they sat before the apostles, they prayed, they laid their hands on them, and the word of God increased. The number of disciples multiplied in Jerusalem greatly, and a great company of the priests were obedient to the faith. <coughs> Uh, if you look up the word deacon <clears throat> in the Greek, it means a servant or a helper. <clears throat> and these men that had been selected were selected to help the body of Christ, to serve the body of Christ, <clears throat> to make sure that people received what they needed. And uh, as a result of it, as you see, the church prospered, the church grew, the division was healed, and uh, uh, it, it, was, it was just a blessing. And uh, these are people that were in right relationship with God, that were full of the Holy Spirit, the Bible says, and <clears throat> God used them in a mighty way if you continue studying in the book of Acts. So they were people that had been called by God in the mission of being a helper and a servant to the body. <clears throat> so this morning... We have the privilege and the blessing of having two fellows that God has called, stirred their spirit, and have agreed to serve in the capacity of deacons this morning. So, Randy, if you'd come forward. Steve, if you'd come forward. <clears throat> we want to receive them today. <clears throat> Fritz, if you would come up with them. And Terrell, are you in the house somewhere? Come down here. <clears throat> All right, <clears throat> fellas, let me just ask you a couple of questions this morning. Do you feel by God to call to, to perform this? Yes. All righty. And you're willing to accept this, this ministry of helps and serving this body to be a help in healing divisions and winning souls and building the body of Christ? Yes. All righty. So if you're willing to do that, and one more question, and I know the answer, but I'll ask it anyway. All right, will you seek God's help through prayer and study of his word so that your service will bring honor to him? Amen. All righty. Church, would you extend your hand towards them, and we're going to pray for them this morning. <clears throat> Father, I want to thank you so much for these two brothers that have come forward, stepping into a position that is not an easy one, a position that, that sometimes can be quite difficult. But, Lord, I thank you for our servant's heart. And I thank you for someone that's willing to say yes to what God is calling them to do. Lord, these are men that we've seen in this body for uh, an extended period of time. Lord, we've seen their life. We've seen their heart for you. And, Lord, we've seen their faithfulness. And I want to thank you for them this morning. So, Lord, in the name of Jesus, I bless Steve. And in the name of Jesus, I bless Randy. And in the name of Jesus, I bless their families today. And, Lord, we receive them as a gift from you. And, Lord, we ask you to surround them with your, your glory and your mercy and grace. Clothe them with the garments that we've talked about this morning. Guide their steps. Guide their thoughts. Guide their decisions. And, Lord, give them a heart, a servant's heart, to minister to this body. So, Lord, I want to thank you so much for them. And, Lord, we just bless them today. We plead the blood of Jesus Christ over them and over their house. And, God, we ask you to prosper them in health, in, in, in provision, and, Lord, in wisdom, and in the ability to let your love flow through them to those about them. Use them, Lord, to build the body, to heal hurts, and to guide and direct Thank you for them. Lord, I just rejoice today that you have called them to step forward and said yes. Thank you, Jesus. In your name we pray. Amen. Now I'm going to ask you to come up and shake hands with them, tell them you love them, whether you do or not.